It is difficult to push forward in the face of adversity when simply giving up may seem so tempting. Tonight, we bring you two stories of tremendous hope and perseverance. They are stories of people who pushed forward when they had every reason to fail. Stick around. That's tonight on The Agenda. Funding for The Agenda with Steve Pagan is provided by Ontario's more than 80,000 chartered professional accountants. Public policy leaders since 1879. More information is available at cpaontario.ca. And by contributions to TVO by viewers like you. Thank you. David McCallum spent nearly three decades behind bars for a crime he did not commit. TVO told you of his story in the documentary David and Me. Last year we had the opportunity to sit down with him and hear more of his extraordinary story. As we open the vault looking back at 10 seasons of the agenda, here is that conversation. The case that you were involved in, what was the crime alleged? Uh, the crime was murder in the second degree and so on October 20th, 1985, uh, a young white male and Queens, New York, was um, kidnapped in front of his home, um, put in his car, and drove off with two African-American people, men. And um, at some point later on during the day, they discovered his body uh, in a park in Brooklyn, in the neighborhood where I actually live, Willie Sucky and I. Did you know him? I, no, I, no, no, I did not. No. You'd never seen the victim before? I've never seen him in my life, no. Hmm. And how did the authorities somehow connect you to this crime? Well, in my neighborhood, it's kind of, crime is kind of rampant, at least back then. And so there were two individuals in my neighborhood who got arrested for a robbery, ironically, in Queens. And so um, during the po point of these individuals' um, arrest, there was an investigation into the Nathan Blenner homicide. And so these two individuals told the police in an adjoining precinct that they knew two individuals in their neighborhood, which turned out to be Willie Stuckey and I, that may know something about the about this about the, the killing. So the cops go find you. Yes. And you're you're what? 15 at the time? I'm 16 years old. 16. Yes. And so was Willie Stuckey. Hmm. And, um, and when the cops find you, what happened then? Well, first Willie Stuckey was arrested first. Okay, he was arrested at 7:30 that day on October 27th, a week later, hmm. and I was arrested at 10:30. And so Willie Stuckey was taken into the precinct, and he, you know, was asked about this particular crime and you know, he implicated me in the crime. And so about three hours later, around 10.30, um, the officers came to arrest me. Why did he implicate you? He implicated me because the detectives um, forced him to um, make statements that, that weren't true. To, you know, uh, Willie Stuckey uh, said to me anyway that he told the police that it was uh, me who shot Mr. Blenner because they f actually forced him to. So, so they bring you in. Yes. You get put under questioning. Yes, I do. And you confessed. Yes, I did. How come? Wow. Um, you know, when I first got into the precinct, I immediately noticed the environment. It was a very small room, which is kind of designed to intimidate suspects. At least I know that. At least during that time, I at least knew that much about police interrogations. And so uh, there was no windows and things like that. And so, you know, when I sat down, the police asked me a question. He asked me, did I know anything about a person being killed on October 20th, which was, of course, a week before. And that's when I said no, he slapped me in the face. In fact, he slapped me so hard that he actually drew blood from my mouth and I was bleeding. And so he asked me again, he said, well, if you don't tell me what I want to hear, I'm going to hit you over here with a chair. And so I, I um, provided false statements that, you know, turned out to have um, been false of, in, uh, in the process of implicating Willie Stuckey as a shooter. How many cops in the room doing the interrogation? There were, there were two cops in the room, and typically what happened, at least back then, at least what happened to Willie Stuckey and I, there was a method called good cop, bad cop. Mm. So what, one cop would be uh, would play as if he's your friend and he's there to comfort you and he's there to sort of to assure you or to reassure you that everything is going to be okay. And so they actually was like idle questions like, how old are you and what are you doing? What, what school you do go to? What kind of grades you have? But then there's the bad guy who's more aggressive than the previous individual. And so that method is kind of successful, especially back then, to sort of um, to get false confessions out of um, suspects. Did they at any time say to you, you can get a lawyer if you want? No, they, they do that when they read your Miranda rights, but I can honestly tell you sitting here right now that when that process is actually done, you don't fully understand what they're saying to you because you, 
you're, you're being accused of something that you know you didn't do. So all these Miranda rights and all the other stuff that go with that, it just kind of goes out the window. You know? so, so I didn't fully understand what, what the rights to be honest. So you wanted to stop the beatings and you confessed to whatever they wanted you to confess to. Yes. And at what point did you decide, you know what, I really didn't do this and I'm now going to proclaim my innocence? Well, that didn't happen until I went in court the next day. And so that's during arraignment. And then you asked, how do you plead? And I said, of course, not guilty. And that started the ball rolling in the, the direction that I originally wanted to, that I didn't commit the crime when we stuck in. So that was kind of the first opportunity that I got to say it on record, you know, legitimately that I didn't commit the crime. So. Did anybody believe you when you said, I'm not guilty? Wow. Um, it, well, first, um, that, kind of, that question kind of starts with my mom. Um, because prior to me being in a precinct and being questioned by these detectives, uh, they wouldn't allow me to call my mom either. You know, they kept me from her. And only after the videotape confessions were made that they actually called my mom for me, but they wouldn't allow me to speak to her. So when I actually saw my mom in court the following morning and I was able to speak to her for a little while, she only asked me one question. She said, David, did you commit this crime? I told her, no, Ma, I did not. And the conversation and the questions with her never came up again, ever. And she, so you told her I didn't do it, and she believed you. Absolutely. Okay. I think we should uh, play a clip from the documentary just to bring people along. Sure. Uh, here is, um, this is your current lawyer, Oscar Michelin, who is speaking. Yes. And then David's mother, your mother speaks after this. So let's roll this clip, please. Roll tape. David is 45 years old. If you just think about what the average person does, between the ages of 17 and 45, the tragedy of David's wrongful convictions should hit home to you. I'm proud of who he became, but I'm not proud that he was there. But uh, I feel like it made a man out of him. I really do. How's your mom now? She's doing pretty good. Um, she, every now and then she has health issues. Um, she um, has diabetes and so every now and then she struggles with that. And so my siblings and I has, have to do sort of a, a better job, I think, of monitoring her hmm. because sometimes she doesn't always pay attention to what she's supposed to do. And so every now and then she gets sick and it's often scary, so we have to really monitor what she eats and just to make sure she eats. So she's doing a better job of as of late. You sound like a good son. Oh, I, well, I would like to think I am, yes. Thank you. Did, did any of, I mean, you were in jail for 30 years. Did, during any of that time, did you sense any doubt in your mother or your siblings as to your innocence? No, I did not. They were with you every step of every the way? Every step of the way, without a doubt. I mean, it was their support that really kind of kept me going, really, because when you incarcerated, especially for a crime that you didn't commit, there's just so many different ways you can go. And so the fact that I was able to get on the telephone with them periodically and speak to them just to know how they were doing and just to let them know that I was gonna be fine and to see them every now and then on visits was pretty special too. And so it was, it was situations and experiences like that that kind of kept things, at least kept me really focused on what I needed to do to get, the, get out of that place. David, I'm going to assume that nobody likes being in jail. Having never been in jail myself, I'm going to assume nobody likes being in jail. What's it like being in jail when you know you haven't done it? Yeah, it's very, very, very difficult. I, I mean, the, as I said before, there are just so, there's so many distractions in prison. Um, there's a lot of violence in prison as well. So you, you have to be very careful what you, in, how, what you pick and choose to do. And so for me, um, the transformation began for me when I got involved with older individuals because I was a, a, young, a very young man when I went to prison. And so I felt like just being around older people would kind of provide a comfort for me. And um, the way that I kind of learned from them was basically mostly through observation in terms of knowing what to do and what not to do. And, and what I've seen, I've usually, I've learned from it and I was pretty good at it, at, you know. And as I, the more I spent time in prison, the better I got at that, so. Just, how, how old were you when you eventually went to jail? I was 16 years old. And so I went to a place called Rikers Island. It's a very, very valid place. We one know of, Rikers. One of the, Everybody knows Rikers. I'm sure they do. Yeah. And one of the most valid places in North America. 
And were you put in with general population? Yes, I was. People top of, much older than you? Yes, yes. It, the unit where I was located at was predominantly adolescent, meaning people my age. But in the jail, they also had adults on the other side of the building. Did you but, get beat up much? Um, no, I did not have any physical altercations other than 20 years later when I got into an altercation. And, you know, I had a simple rule that I sort of adapted, uh, adopted along the way. And that was I would not put my hands on anybody unless they put their hands on me first. Mm -hmm. And um, so for me, it was, I wouldn't say it was smooth selling. You get into arguments and debates. Who wouldn't after spending that, that much time in in prison, we, you know, frustration sometimes ran rapid, you know, and it's particularly in the summertime where violence is really prevalent, you know, because, you know, it's hot and, and people get frustrated. What so, did you do to keep your sanity? Well, for me, um, I, you know, I just decided one day, and it was a process, of course, it just, it just didn't, it didn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I tried to do is um, just stay busy and stay, once you stay busy and you know, you, you really focus on what you, what you need to do to sort of navigate your way throughout, through the system. Um, you become comfortable in certain things that you did. So what me, what I did was, because I came from a difficult background, mm -hmm. so what I, I tried to, I worked with other inmates. You know, I ran and facilitated other groups. Um, played some sports? Um, I played sports, obviously, and um, facilitating like groups like Alternative to Violence, where we would sit among other inmates in a group and we would talk about our past. And because I, you know, learned to be so open about my personal experiences, I was able to kind of help other guys be open about themselves too. David, I, I can imagine that at numerous points during your imprisonment, authorities came to you and said, you know, if you just fessed up to this, we can let, we can let you out of here right now for time spent. Right. Why did you never avail yourself of that option? Right, and so after I was sentenced to 25 years to life, and after 25 years, which is your minimum, you become eligible for parole. And so I became eligible for parole. Eligible for parole, I did all the things that we uh, that are required of an inmate to do in terms of my programming. But I'd like to think I did some things more. But more importantly, I did these things for myself. And so when I went to the NID's parole hearings, I'm asked, "Are you expected? At least one of the requirements of parole is you're expected to take responsibility for the crime." and to show, to show some kind of remorse. But because I didn't do any of those things, I was denied parole four times. And so, um, you know, I just couldn't find myself to admit to any, something that I didn't do. And if that meant staying in prison for the rest of my life, then I was perfectly willing to, willing to do that. And, um, and, you know, and so... Um, Where does the strength to make that decision come from? It just comes from the truth, honestly. I think there's nothing more powerful than the truth. And you can't hide the truth. You can't run from the truth. And so I just, I stayed with the truth. And that was the most important and most effective weapon that I, that I had at my disposal. So I used it at every turn and at every opportunity I could. You know the hurricane. Yes, I do. Reuben, Hurricane Carter, yes. one-time boxer who dedicated so much of his life to championing the cases of those who have been wrongfully convicted. He wrote an editorial in the New York Daily News last February, and I want to read you just a piece of what he wrote. He said, I am now quite literally on my deathbed and am making my final wish to those with the legal authority to act. My single regret in life is that David McCallan of Brooklyn, a man incarcerated in 1985, the same year I was released, and represented by Inter Innocence International since 2004, is still in prison. I request only that McCallum be granted a full hearing by the Brooklyn Conviction Integrity Unit, now under the auspices of the new district attorney, Ken Thompson. Knowing what I do, I am certain that when the facts are brought to light, Thompson will recommend his, meaning your, immediate release. Okay, how did the hurricane get involved with your case? Wow, it, it, it's kind of a long story, but I'll, I'll do my very best to make it as brief as I possibly can. Um, I was working in a law library at a place called Eastern Correctional Facility in, in the middle of New York State. And, you know, in a law library, just like I guess in anywhere in life, you become bored, you get bored. So um, I came across Ruben's magazine and reading an interview between Ken Klonsky and Ruben Carter. I read the interview. I knew who Ruben was because of his past. He was a former, a former uh, prize fighter. And, mm -hmm. um, of course, he was also wrongfully convicted and spent 20 years in prison himself. Mm -hmm. So what I decided to do, and because of my state and federal appeals had, were exhausted, in, and, of course, in the mid-1993, I started a letter-writing campaign. Um, I wrote, uh, let's say, about 600 letters or so. I'm hoping that I can get someone to take, at least take an interest in my case. 
but I was repeatedly um, denied opportunities for that. But I didn't let that deter me or the, or, you know, from continuing writing letters. So when I um, wrote the Sun magazine, hoping to get in contact with Ruben, um, they, they wrote me back and said, look, we can't give you this information because it's confidential. But what they did say was we can forward your letter on to the interviewer, which was Ken Klonsky. So um, they did that. And uh, a couple of weeks later, Mr. Klonsky, he wrote me back and he said, look, David, um, I have received your letter from the Sun and I uh, understand your story. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. But he also said that he couldn't promise me anything. He couldn't promise me whether Ruben would take an interest in the case or not. So I wrote Mr. Klonsky back and said, fine. Um, if you or Mr. Carter able, was able to help me in any kind of way, I would appreciate it. But if not, I would also appreciate your time anyway. So about three weeks later, Mr. Klonsky wrote me back and said, look, Ruben's interested in you. And of course, um, that was sort of music to my ears. And so I kind of went back to my cell you know, at the time, and I just broke down and cried because I, I felt at the very least somebody was going to hear my cry. And at the time, that's kind of really all I, all I wanted. I just wanted somebody to hear me and just to just listen. I and mean, whether they could have helped me in the end or not, that was, that was okay. I just wanted somebody just to believe that what I was telling them was true. How influential do you think Reuben Carter was in the eventual overturning of the verdict? Oh, I think it was huge. I think Reuben's been, I think his letter alone was, very, was huge. You know, to read a letter like that, um, I can't help but to think anyone would be emotional after reading something like that. In fact, um, his letter was sort of, his letter was put through the inmate population and a lot of guys was able to read his letter. A lot of guys walked up to me with tears in their eyes crying. So, I, I mean, the district attorney's office is a whole entirely animal in and of themselves, but at the same time, they're human beings. So I think that would touch any human being. David, you seem remarkably not bitter, remarkably unangry for a guy who had three decades of his life taken away from him. Yes. How come? Well, I'd be perfectly honest with you. I'd be lying if I said that, said that I was at some points during my incarceration that I wasn't angry or frustrated or disappointed with what happened to me. But at the same time, I also realized that I had a mission. I had a purpose, right? And my purpose was to try to get myself out of this position as quickly as I could. So I think when people say angry, it's usually associated with negativity, you know, so, and my, my uh, philosophy is that anger doesn't always have to be translated to violence. Mm -hmm. So what I try to do with my frustration and my anger and bitterness is to try to do something constructive. So that means um, interacting and getting involved with programs while I was in prison, trying to do, helping out other inmates and volunteering for certain programs, just to sort of keep myself busy. But more importantly, it was really designed to sort of help out some other people. And it actually kind of served as a, some form of therapy during certain points of my incarceration. I think that, and I also think it's it kind of played a significant role in the transformation that I was able to make in due time. And I think Ruben and Ken Klonsky had a lot to do with that. And, and so I'm, I'll always be grateful for Ruben. Um, what happened to Willie Stuckey? Willie Stuckey, unfortunately, he passed away in prison at, you know, on December 3rd, 2001. Um, we didn't find out till later during October 15th, the day I was actually released and our cases were dismissed that Mr. Stuckey died from a heart attack, according to the district attorney's office. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know that at the time that I found out in 2003, um, because that information is confidential. It's only, um, they would only allow like, his parents or his family or next of kin to know that kind of information. How old was he when he died? Willie Stuckey was 32 years old mm -hmm. when he passed away. Do you, I mean, I would assume that at this point, you gotta go out there and just sue a whole hell of a lot of people. I mean, you got, <laughs> I mean, you got a lot of catching up to do. Are you going to do that? Yes, I am. Um, you know, when I was working on my case, um, the, the thought of compensation, to be perfectly honest with you, it wasn't a focal point for me because at that stage of my life, I was more interested in getting the heck out of that place as soon as I could. But I'd be also lying if I said that I would, wouldn't want to be compensated. Who wouldn't? But at the same time, in reality, no amount of money would, would kind of get back what I lost. I feel like I lost a whole bunch. I lost fam definite family debts. Uh, Willie Stuckey's no longer here, so I know when I walked out of the courtroom by myself, it was, it was really, truly, truly bittersweet. It was, of course, I was ecstatic at the fact that I was able to walk out of that place, but I was also, it was also very, very painful because when the judge was actually making his decision, I was sitting next to his mom, and we were holding hands, you know. But prior to going in the courtroom, um, his mom said some very profound things to me, and one thing she said was, it was supposed to be two of you. 
And, you know, what can you really say after hearing something like that? So when we go into the courtroom and after the judge makes his decision, you know, I, of course, broke down with all sorts of emotion, 29 years of, of frustration. And his mom, we hugged and embraced, and she said, you are my son now. And so when she said that, I still, to this day, can't understand how I was able to compose myself, you know, after hearing something like that, because, you know, that just reassured me. And, I, like, I didn't do anything wrong. But at the same time, I felt a sense of guilt, me walking out of there, and he's not able to. Mm. So that was a very, very difficult situation. What about the cops who put you in there in the first place? Are they still on the job? They're, they're deceased, from what I understand. Okay. And, um, you know, not, not too many fond things to say about those guys. I can assure you that. But, yeah, as far as I know, they're deceased. How long have you been out of jail now? I've been out of jail um, almost two months. And so um, I know I have a long way to go. How difficult is the transition going from incarceration, where they tell you what to do, when to do it, when you're going to bed, when you're awake, everything of your life is organized, and now you have freedom? You know, it, it, I've been asked the question. Obviously, it's a very good one. But mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, the chat, it really hasn't been as difficult as I actually thought it would be. Mm -hmm. And I attribute that to the great support system that I had over the years. And, you know, I, I feel like I've been prepared for the most part. I, I know there's still issues to work out and, and to address, but I think I, I feel like I've been prepared for this moment. So I've never quite, I can't quite say that I've been overwhelmed with, with, with a lot of different things because, I, you know, like I said, I, I think I've been, I've been somewhat prepared for it. But there are challenges, to say the least. I mean, psychological challenges, most, psychological challenges mostly. Um, when, like, when I'm by myself, I'm perfectly fine when I'm talking to other individuals, but when I'm alone and by myself, when my mind starts to wonder, it always goes back to Willie Stuckey, you know, because I know he's not here, and here I am on the outside, and the fact that he, he's not here, that kind of bothers me. It's almost like when you're in the military, I guess, and, and I am no way in trying to compare my situation to someone who went and fought a war and didn't make it back, but I felt guilty, the fact that I was out, and he's not. So it took me some time to reconnect with his mom after I was out, that sort of thing, because I was really afraid of the reaction. Although, even though I was already assured that things, that she was okay, you know. Did they ever get the guys who really did the crime? No, they did not. But from, according to the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, they have some very strong leads that they say they're going to pursue. Mm -hmm. And we'll just have to see if they're going to maintain that promise that they made. David, it's a great pleasure to meet you. The documentary is called David and Me. It's on TVO, and we wish you well with your future, which I hope is a long one. I second that, and I <laughs> definitely hope it is, too. There's <laughs> certainly a lot of life out on the outside, and it actually feels great to be out here and to, to be in Toronto, a place I actually dreamed of coming to while I was incarcerated. And um, it's almost like a dream come true to be in the city, and I'm so glad to be here. All the best. Thank you very much. We recorded that conversation back in 2014. David has now been out of prison for more than a year. How has life changed for him since he was released? Well, let's ask him. We welcome back David McCallum, who joins us now on the line from New York City. It is so good to see you again, David. So let's ask, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, Steve. Thank you for asking. Now, uh, what defines pretty good? What makes life pretty good right now? Wow, um, just being able to um, be up out of be out of that place and you know, um, just being able to adapt to a place that I've left a long time ago and just to come back into society again and you know, be able to spend a lot of time with my family and, and friends and, and all sorts of things and do some of the things that I've often dreamed about when I was incarcerated. So just to have the opportunity to do those things now is definitely, um, definitely re rewarding. For have, sure. you, have you got yourself a job yet? Yes, I do, as a matter of fact, yes. What you got? Well, I'm, I'm right now I'm working for the Manhattan Legal Aid Society, so I work for the Juvenile Rights Division. Um, during, um, I'm a support staff member, so um, having you know uh, been on, at the job for a little over six months now, and I have to say that I, I really enjoy doing what I'm doing. It's a very rewarding work for me, and just to be able to get up in the morning and go to work every morning for me is just a thrill. Well, you do know that there are lots of people out there who find it. Uh kind of a drudgery to get up every day and go off to do a job that they're not thrilled with. Uh, have you experienced any of that yet? No, not quite. I think for me, I guess one can say that it's a lot of adrenaline, a lot of emotion still.
But I think for me, having been in that place for so long and never really had the opportunity to have what I would call a real job, um, for me, I'm taking no, take nothing for granted. I, I really enjoy what I'm doing. It's the kind of work that I wanted to do from the very beginning. And just to have the opportunity to get up in the morning, perhaps 5 o'clock every morning, just to be able to go to work. And, and it's, it, to me, it's, it feels really good. At some point, I guess it would wear off. But for me, at the <laughs> moment, it's, it's working perfectly. Glad to hear it. David, what was it like when they handed you your first paycheck? Wow, uh, for me it was really surreal because again, um, never had a job before, so uh, I never knew what a pay stub would look like. So when they actually gave me, had me handed me my um, check for the very first time, I was really stunned. Really, I think I was sort of numb to some extent, you know. But at the same time, knowing that I actually earned the money, um, it, it, it was it felt really good. Now, David, did you notice when they handed you the pay stub that? they actually do deduct a lot of the money that they pay you for things like taxes and other things. Did you notice that? I sure did. In <laughs> fact, uh, I recall um, showing my mom for the very first time. And as I'm showing my mom the check, I'm looking at it while at the same time she's looking at me and I'm saying to myself, oh my God, what, what happened here? <laughs> I, I, I almost wanted to cry in front of her, but of course I had to put on a brave face just to show how happy I was, but although I was really feeling it inside, just the fact that they took so much money for taxes, <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. I really, I couldn't believe it. I've often read about these things while I was incarcerated, of course, but to actually have it happen to me um, was, uh, wow, it was <laughs> very, very disappointing. <laughs> uh, disappointing. So, David, are you now a part of the Republican chapter of the Tea Party in upstate New York, or what's the story? Oh, wow. No, as a matter of fact, I'm actually, uh, I would like to classify myself as an independent. Independent, I think sometimes okay. We'll, yes, yes. <laughs> I think sometimes when we take sides in this political battle, so to speak, I, I think we sometimes get lost in what really needs to be done, you know, for all people. So um, I just uh, I try to be an independent thinker, and I think for a very long time it's got me to a very good place. Well, so I guess I'm going to stick with that. I guess you're going to have a chance to vote for president for the first time in your life. Do you have a candidate yet? Um, actually, I don't. In fact, well, I'm actually leaning towards someone like Bernie Sanders, but unfortunately, um, Dylan, Dylan, I guess we, um, regarding the, the political landscape, probably doesn't doesn't necessarily warm to him. But I think for me, at least at the moment, he really seemed like a better candidate, in my opinion, because he would definitely be someone I would really take a really good long look at. That's for sure. Let me ask you about some things that I suspect everybody who's watching you right now takes for granted. But we have to remember that you went away so long ago um, you've missed so much. For example, have you ever used a smartphone? No, I have not. Do you have one now? Yes, I do. So what's that like trying to learn at, how old are you now, David? I am 46 years old. So you're 46 and you're using a smartphone for the first time in your life. What's that like? Wow, it's actually frustrating, confusing, exciting, all those things wrapped into one. I think for me, um, Technology, it's really, I mean, it's always evolving. So um, I, I have this phone for uh, basically a little over uh, uh, a year now. And um, I'm still f trying to figure how, how to navigate certain systems on the phone. But for me, I think because I have a pretty good support system, a lot of good uh, family and friends to kind of help me around and show me some things. And even colleagues at work have been able to share some of their expertise with me, so to speak. So I think from the standpoint of learning technology, it's been pretty eventful. But at the same time, as I said earlier, it's also been very frustrating, too. But uh, you know what? I'm not going to complain, Steve, because uh, <laughs> um, I'd rather have these. These, these are good problems, in, in my opinion. So um, I'm, I'll be fine. I hear you on that. Now, of course, um, before you were sent away, wrongly convicted, uh, had you ever been on an airplane before in your life? No, I have not. Have you been on a plane? Well, you've been on a plane now, yes? Yes, I have. I've been on a few planes, actually. Um, you know, my very first trip was, was, of course, to Montreal, Quebec. Mm -hmm. And I went out there with my attorney. And I think and, and they, he was looking, he was, I guess he was, he was kind of suspecting that maybe I was a bit nervous and all those sorts of things. But for me, I, was, I really wasn't. I was really excited and anxious, really, because um, when I was incarcerated, I had a lot of family and friends, particularly a lot of friends, come to visit me, and they used to always share with their travels with me in terms of getting on and on planes. And so I used to listen to their stories a lot, obviously, and so I said to myself, you know, 
if I ever got the opportunity to get out of this place and be able to travel on a plane, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be scared because I just remember that some of the conversations which sounded to me so exciting to do. So when I got on a plane for the very first time to Montreal, it was fantastic. And so my second trip to Toronto was even better because it was a it was you know a pretty good flight and um, the stewardess on board they really they sort of welcomed me. They clapped for me because some of my friends said that that was that was my my second flight. You know, so hmm. um, it, it was a, it was a good experience. Um, traveling from New York to Toronto. I always enjoyed that trip. No, moment, five times, so. no moments of nervousness on the flight? Uh, well, to be perfectly honest with you, I'd be remiss if I, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a bit nervous at times because <laughs> there's something called turbulence. And when I experienced <laughs> that for the first time, I, you know, your eyes get big, you know, because you don't, <laughs> at least for me, I, I had no idea what was really going on here, but, you know, <laughs> You know, for me, you, you try to say, okay, I've heard, this story, I heard these stories before and everything's fine. But, you know, your heart skips a beat or two every now and then when, it, when that thing comes up. But, again, it's part of the experience of flying. And uh, I'm not necessarily used to flying, but don't particularly care for it that much. <laughs> but it was exciting, and it's exciting at times to do it. So um, I'm just glad to have the opportunity to do that. Now, of course, one of the things that you would not have been permitted to do when you were behind bars because of your improper conviction was to date so I'm going to ask you now, are you dating anybody or have you figured that scene out yet? Oh, that scene has been figured out um, about six and a half months ago. I mean, um, I had the opportunity to meet a very, very nice woman named Valerie and me and her has been together um, a, a bit over six months and we are going pretty good so far. And in fact, I met Valerie on a dating app called Tinder. Um, and so, you know, um, got on the dating site, and that's, of course, Tinder is one of those, those apps where you sort of message when someone, when you meet them, and you can either swipe right or swipe left. But fortunately for me, and equally fortunate for her, we both swipe right, and so we've been together ever since. We have a pretty good relationship so far. Isn't that wonderful? So I guess you are figuring out this smartphone online cyberspace technology pretty well. I am, I am. Mm -hmm. But I would have to say Facebook, I guess m me and Facebook, uh, I'm not, I can do without Facebook. Um, I think when I first got out um, in terms of Facebook, um, I was really messaging a lot of people, sort of friending a lot of people, not really realizing what I was actually doing. So for me, I'm, I've been on Facebook for some time now, and um, I don't really care for it. Um, I think privacy, to some extent, is important, and so I want to try to, uh, to keep, that, keep it that way. Hmm. David, I know you've seen the documentary of your life, so you've seen a movie, but, uh, you know, that's a documentary and it's about you. Have you gone to just a regular any kind of Sunday afternoon movie that has nothing to do with you? Just pure escapist entertainment, and if so, what'd you see and what'd you think? Wow, absolutely. So for me, um, very good question, thank you. Um, yes, I have. I went, the very first movie I saw since when I was out of prison was a movie called Broken. And, you know, the movie itself was very inspirational and motivational. And for me, I used to always see or hear previews of this movie when I was incarcerated, and of course when I was home, I saw promos of it on television. So. This movie is about an individual who um, was went to war. He was a track star early in his years and went to war, and he was he was brutal. He was basically um, abused, you know. But the fact that this guy had a lot of courage, a lot of strength and determination to survive what he was going through, it kind of reminded me and kind of brought me back to some of the trials and tribulations that I was experiencing when I was incarcerated. So that movie was, uh, I think, the ideal movie for a person like me to see, just to sort of remind me that it was a fight to get out. Mm -hmm. But going to the movies was a, a very good experience for me because I can recall going to the movies as a kid, eating popcorn, those sorts of things, and just sitting in, sitting in the theater, enjoying a really good movie. It, was, it felt real good to do that. Wonderful. Now, having said that, you know, some things in New York have not changed. Uh, I don't want to be unfair about this, but let's put it this way. There are still tense relationships from time to time between officers in the New York PD and young black teens, which is what you were once upon a time. Uh, when you had your conflict with the police, and, and um, I know you're suing a, the estate of the uh, deceased officer who improperly put you behind bars. When you look out at the criminal justice situation in New York City right now, what are you seeing? Well, it's very sad to be honest with you because I know back in 1985, of course, when we and Willie was arrested, um, there was always heightened um, situations with um, the community and, and law enforcement. You know, so when you when you look back look at that then and now, 
they're very similar. There's similar patterns. Um, today is is, is, is is very sad, but I know they have a movement called Black Lives Matter. And when I think about this movement, I'm not necessarily sure what that means anymore. Is it does it mean um, law enforcement? Um, I mean, does it mean black on black crime? I'm not sure exactly what that movement means anymore, which is kind of sad, at least in my opinion. But I, I think when you look at the criminal justice system today, it's vastly unfair, especially when you look at the incarcerated rates of uh, young African Americans and Latino uh, men and women, for that matter. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really sad, and, uh, and unfortunately, here in New York City, um, you know, p the, the public it, well, is very, very scared to death. Uh, and it well should be in some regards, but at the same time, um, the system is 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 is, vastly, is very unfair, and it it really treats young people, I think, very unfairly. We look at the unemployment rate of young people, and you know we often complain here in New York City about young kids hanging out on the streets doing these sorts of things. But I often say, uh, where are the jobs for these young men and women? You know, for them to sort of keep themselves busy. So when you couple all these things together, you're going to come up with a situation where violence is going to be. Is going to resonate throughout New York City, which is which is doing now. So when we talk about the crime rate, there's a particular reason why the crime rate is very high. So, hmm. David, in our last minute here, I know there were a lot of people who predicted and hoped that when America got its first black president, race relations would improve. What do you see? Well, uh, unfortunately, um, that's at least not that's not the case for me. I think me personally, when I judge the president, when I judge President Obama. I, I, pr I prefer to judge him on what's happening in the community in which I live in. So when I see these sorts of things that haven't changed for a large, large extent, I, you know, I look at it. It's just very, it's very, very unfortunate. I, I know for me, for example, um, and maybe this just this because I, you know, been recently from prison a little over a year ago. Um, you know, people are prejudiced in their own different ways. You know, for example, on a train, you be on a train with people and they're crowded people, and you know, you want to try to stay out of people's way and pe out of people's faces and those sorts of things. But it's there; it's always going to be there, unfortunately. And I use the word "always" very, very loosely because, for me, I, 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 in order for these things to change, I think education has to become the number one priority for all American people and all people in general for race relations to improve, especially in the city, especially in a place like New York City. So hmm. um, I hate to paint, paint a bleak picture there, but that's sort of my experience, at least so far, with the hope and expectation that things can somehow change in the future. Well, my hunch is that you're going to be that change. I got a feeling that because of what you've been through, you're not going to waste your life. You are going to be a constructive force for good going forward, and we wish you just all the good luck in the world in that endeavor. Great to spend some time with you, David. Thanks so much. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Steve. And I'd really like to say a special thanks and a special shout out to the people of the city of Toronto. Uh, for a very long time, they've treated me very well, and I'll never forget the, what they've done for me during my time incarcerated and actually during my post release. So I'd like to thank the, the city of Toronto for treating me so well. Come visit anytime. I know you've got lots of friends here. Thanks, David. Oh, yes. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Up next, more perseverance in the face of adversity. Marilyn Shirley from season nine, right after this. Marilyn Shirley once lived a very public life. She was a high profile Toronto City Councillor and Ontario Cabinet Minister in the NDP government of the early 1990s. But what a lot of people didn't know was that at age 19, Shirley had given up a baby for adoption under quite appalling circumstances. She went on to make it her life's mission to open up the adoption disclosure system in Ontario. She chronicles it all in her new book, Shameless. Uh, take us through the mindset when you eventually made the decision, I have to find this guy. I got to find him. I got to do whatever it takes to find legally to yeah. find him. How did you get to that place? Well, it was during that time I met a woman named Holly Kramer, who is featured in in the book sub significantly. She was then president of Parent Finders. She had found her own. She was an adult adoptee, her own biological mother on her own in the seventies. She's a very tenacious person. Mm -hmm. She. Uh, uh, she had helped many people through Parent Finders connect. And I now felt emotionally ready to deal with this. I also had decided
that I was going to give him as much opportunity himself to find me as an adult. My name was in the phone book. As you know, it was in every elevator in, in Ontario. That is true. Your signature was in all the elevators. And it was a very yeah. clear one, and he used to yeah. see it. He told me later in elevators and think, nah, that can't be my mother. Because he knew your last name. He did. Right? From his, the birth certificate? Yes. His parents had shown him. My, so he knew. He knew he had a mom with a last, his birth mom's yeah. last name was Shirley. He kept saying no. He could. But I just decided that the time had come. I was ready and that I wanted to find him. And that became a mission. I got in touch with Holly and she gave me all kinds of good advice. A woman named Alice McDonald from the Barry area, which is where he was adopted in that mm -hmm. general area, got involved. And she's an angel. Did this is before, we're talking about before the internet. People looked at newspaper clippings, hmm. and driver's license, and probably had some secret things that I don't know about. Hmm. But they found ways to connect people. And it took about a year, but I gave her my so-called non-identifying information. But it was enough to give some hints. I knew where he was born. Obviously, I knew the date. Um, I knew the location. And the letter said things about a Dutch background, they owned a small fabric business, and there was enough there that it was pieced together, and it took about a year, but finally he was found. You then have to make a decision, do I call him, do I write him a letter, do I just show up at his front door? How did you work through those options? Well, first of all, it's a myth that people show up at front doors from either side. We go through such turmoil in the process of looking, we don't want to do anything that will alienate the other person. So that mythical lock, knock on the door that became such an issue when we were trying to pass the bill just doesn't happen. Tempting, yes, <laughs> but I didn't do it. I wrote him a letter, and I wrote him a le letter through Holly Kramer, through Parent Finders. And he took his time responding, right? He did. Took a long time took to respond. Took a long time, uh, yeah. Not because he was avoiding you, but no, just... No, uh, he was away at university, yeah. and he came home, and he was told about a registered letter. Ah, I don't know this person. Her, Holly's name was on it. He came home for Christmas, and to his shock, the letter was waiting for, waiting for him then, and he didn't answer right away. He, he, when he finally wrote to me, he said that he needed, he was happy to get it, but shocked, and he mm. needed some time to think about how to respond. Did that uh, concern you, that he wanted that time? No, no, I was just so happy that he was found. I knew his name, I knew where he lived, I knew he was alive. I knew he was well. And how you old is he at this point? He's 28. 28 now? Yes, oh yes, he's not a kid anymore. But the, the joy of knowing, you have to understand, we don't even know if our children are alive. Right. It's not just a matter of wanting to connect because that all doesn't always happen. There are not, all, all the stories don't have happy endings like mine, mm -hmm. but people need to know. Mm -hmm. I would have been terribly disappointed had he said, no, I don't want a relationship. And it does happen. But just knowing he was alive and well just took a huge weight off me. So phone call next? Phone call next. You heard his voice for the first time? Yes. How was that? It was overwhelming. I, I describe it in the book. It was an incredible feeling that I haven't helped, felt before or since. It was like it, it, there was something tight coiled inside me. And when I heard his voice for the first time, I said very casually, hi, Marilyn, it's Bill there. And, or William, I was calling him William at the time. Is William there? He said, this is he. And I sounded normal, okay, and we arranged a date to get together, but when I sat down afterwards, it was like this coil unfurling, and it got softer and softer, and I just felt this melt, this melting feeling inside. It was just overwhelming. Of course, I cried and shook and all of that stuff, but it was just an amazing feeling, Steve. Now, you still have no idea what he looks like, right? That's right. So, how do you no, see... No, that is not true. No? He had, by the time I called him, we had been exchanging letters, and he did send me a picture. You'll recall, okay. I mentioned a, a photograph before we actually met where he's walking down the aisle at a wedding, and I described him as more handsome than Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> That's Which right. He is. That's right. And you... Uh, do I remember this right? You kept his picture on your desk at Queen's Park in the legislature. I did, yes. And, and looked at it during question period. Looked at it all the time. I kept his, when I found out his name, before I even found, before I connected with him, I wrote down his name on a piece of paper. 
sounds so melodramatic, I know, but we all go through this. It's a pretty dramatic situation. I wrote it down because I never knew. I named him Andrew, but his parents changed his name to William. So I wrote down my son's name is William. My son's name is William. My son's name is William. That's him with your folks, right? Yes. That's him with your parents. Good looking boy. He is a good looking, I told you. <laughs> yes, indeed. Okay, tell us about first contact. How did that happen? My first contact with, with Billy? When you actually met him and right. set eyes upon him for the right. first time. Right, right. Well, I remember driving to Queen's Park first. I had to take care of some business and then jumping in my car and starting to drive to Waterloo where he was a student. Mm -hmm. That was before GP, G, uh, GPS, of course I get lost. Mm -hmm. But um, we had arranged to meet at his townhouse in, in Waterloo. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and I, I don't know if I can describe this one, Steve, well, without. Marilyn, you know what? Take a sip of water and I'm gonna help you out here. Please. From your book. I was trembling as I approached the door. It was an ordinary door, but I knew that when it opened, I would enter an extraordinary new world. I had spent so many years thinking about the day when I would come face to face with my son, but now that it was here, I was barely thinking at all. I could feel my heart racing and my body trembling. My mind went very, very still. I was simply in the moment. I knocked, waited, heard footsteps, the door opened, and there he was, my son. What happened next? Well, we stood there. I didn't know what to do. And then, I can't do it. He held out his arms to me and hugged me. How'd that feel? You've been waiting a long time for that. It was incredible. He was my son and I, actually you have to think, I was holding him in my arms for the first time. Even though I gave birth to him and held him in my body for nine months, it's the first time I actually held him in my arms. So it was an incredible moment. Um, we both cried. I mean, it was a very emotional moment for both of us. And then we settled down and he said, come on in. And I walked through that door and it was an extraordinary new world. Everything changed in that moment. Well, this all leads now to the very long and very torturous process of you trying to get a bill passed in the Ontario legislature that would open up the whole adoption process in this province. How many bills at the end of the day were introduced trying to deal with this issue? Well, five by me. There was one by Tony Martin, which was filibustered by uh, both the conservative, not all, but conservatives and liberals at the time. So that's six. Uh, so now six. And then Alex uh, Cullen, who was a liberal at the time, but then crossed the floor to right. New Democrats. Ottawa guy. He also had a private member's bill. So that's seven. So that's seven. And then, of course, finally, there was the government bill. But I had five. Oh, between, I think, 1998 and 2005, somewhere in there. And it seemed every time you got close to having this thing actually go ahead, some damn thing would happen. House would get prorogued or you'd run out of time or yeah. you know, something like yeah. that. Did you think it was never going to happen? I wasn't going to leave that place <laughs> until it happened. And uh, I, no, I believed it would happen. I, I was quite surprised, Steve, at how... Uh, controversial it was because to me it was doing a reasonable thing. It was correcting a historical, a historic wrong that had been done successfully in BC. By the time we got around to passing it in Ontario, Newfoundland and Labrador, my home province that I'm very proud of, uh, now has the most, by the way, uh, most progressive adoption disclosure laws in the land. Uh, Alberta, even Alberta had gone there and jurisdictions all over the world. It wasn't like we were inventing the wheel. No, but here was your problem. And I'm going to read now, uh, you have this in the book. This was the Information and Privacy Commissioner, Ann Kavukian, who yes. said that she was inundated with emotional letters from people who did not want the process opened up. And here's what one of them wrote to her. She said, I don't wish to see the child. I don't know the man who, was, uh, who raped me. I can't tell them anything about that man. That was way back in the 1960s. I was promised that my name wouldn't be disclosed. I would feel just ultimately betrayed. I'm afraid I would simply go into the garage, shut the garage door, and block the exhaust in my car and end my life over this. Now, you had your reasons for wanting this opened up, but when you heard stuff like this, I mean, presumably you could understand why people opposed it. Not really. No? No. And let me tell you why. Sure. 
people were beginning to find each other more and more through the internet and other means as you know, everything evolved. And we're actually doing a pretty good job of being able to find each other with no laws in place. The law that we had put forward had a contact veto. And Which means what? It means that people could have the, had the right to their own information, adults, mm -hmm. not children, but they could place a contact veto saying, I don't want to meet this person. I don't want them in my life. Before this law, that didn't even exist. For instance, for example, when I found my son, if I'd wanted to, I could have shown up at his door. Uh, now, there are anti-stalking laws anyway, but y you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. We tried to make that point that there, finally, with the new law, it would be easier to get information. As a human rights, we felt that, and still do, that people have the right to their own information. But that there would be actually a law in place that said you can't see this person if they don't want to see you. Mm -hmm. There, we also had tons of letters, many more than that, from people, adoptees in particular, but, but first mothers uh, who also were suicidal. And it was, a, it was difficult to handle because you just read it and it has a huge impact on people. And mm -hmm. no doubt a few people feel that way about it. But the reality is there was still, some, there was something in law that prevented contact. The other thing is that we did not want to get into that quagmire of trying to figure out who's most at risk because there were, no doubt, some biological mothers, we call ourselves first mothers now, or natural mothers, um, that felt they were promised that they'd never have to hear about it again. But thousands and thousands and thousands were looking, never, never were given that promise and didn't want that promise made. So we felt it was reasonable to build a law that had some um, safeguards in it. And that, to us, indicated that um, it, was, it seemed a bit like fear-mongering, because then John Tory, who was then, he's now the mayor of Toronto, was then the leader of the, the, the uh, Conservatives, was supportive at first. But he described having a conversation with her, and he started raising that, those kinds of questions in the legislature. And it made everybody nervous, for good reason. But I'm sure you read in the book uh, a very moving deputation, a fellow who came down to, uh, to the committee and talked about the fact that he had been uh, a child of, of a rape situation and had found his, his mother and how it, in fact, his birth mother and how it healed her. All we were saying is that this had been done in many other jurisdictions with no harm done. And to focus on that one piece, important to recognize it, but not to therefore say, therefore, nobody who want to get this information, who want to form relationships, should have it. Well, finally, 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 a bill gets passed by the Ontario Legislature. Sandra Pupatello is the Community and Social yes. Services Minister, so the bill is in her name. And I'll read an excerpt of how that bill got passed and what that day was like. The clerk announced, all those in favor will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. You write, I could feel all eyes on me, even though as sponsor of the bill, Minister Sandra Pupatello was the first to stand. I was the first of the New Democrats to stand to vote. I had tears streaming down my face as I bowed to the speaker. And when I made that affirmative nod, the lid came off the place. It erupted for several minutes in loud and joyous cheers and hoots. Then came the final tally. The ayes are 68, the nays are 19. I declare the motion carried. I was overcome by emotion. After more than 25 years, fairness was coming at last to adoptees and their birth parents. What do you remember all these years later about that moment? Well, I knew that I was leaving the legislature. I had already said that I, I was resigning to run federally. Mm -hmm. And I had also told myself that I was not leaving the legislature until <laughs> a bill passed. So if it, if it hadn't passed then, I might have had to renege on running federally and not resign. But uh, I'd worked very hard with, with uh, Sandra, who was very good, did a great job under a lot of pressure, particularly then from the Conservatives, but some in her own party too. Um, she did not relent, and she was steadfast and got it done. And she learned, she asked for information, and was ready to, to, to just walk down that line and take on the battle. She got it. She really got it. And, um, 
Kathleen Wynne, the, the Premier of Ontario, was very involved too because she was a backbencher in the Liberals then and was on the committee. So it was one of those um, situations where, in particular, two parties were working very closely together. And I know quite a few Conservatives wanted to support it, but the party line was to be opposed to it. So they all, all the Tories who showed up to vote voted against voted it. Voted against. And but some, some didn't show up. You know, like John, John Baird, for instance, who I knew was very supportive. And he told me afterwards that he would have liked to have been there to support it, but felt he couldn't go against the party mm -hmm. position. So when, that, when the, the vote was tallied and the speaker read out the, the I mean, I, yes, the tears were running down my face, but there were tears of joy. My son was sitting in the, uh, in the gallery watching all this happen, and there were the full, the whole place was full of people from the adoption community who had worked on it for years. The whole place did erupt, and nobody stopped people from cheering or <laughs> threatened to kick them out. And uh, I felt just overwhelming joy that after all these years that I had found my son. It wasn't for me anymore. Uh, it was for everybody else. And that is the agenda for Monday, December 7th, 2015. Tomorrow on the program, it's no secret the relationship we have with our parents plays a huge role in shaping us. Hope you can join us tomorrow as we examine what happens when the apple falls far from the tree. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Funding for The Agenda with Steve Pakin is provided by Ontario's more than 80,000 chartered professional accountants. Public policy leaders since 1879. More information is available at cpaontario.ca. And by contributions to TVO by viewers like you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.